make sure you know what your product and identity is going to be. And then through that, know what your project cost is going to be and then know what your margins are for sure. Welcome to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods, the nation's first podcast devoted to the business and lifestyle of the hospitality industry. Now, here's your host, Woolco Foods CEO, Stephen Toberoff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. I am your host, Stephen Toberoff, and today my guest is someone that I'm very much looking forward to for a lot of different reasons. The timing of the interview is perfect. The location of the restaurant is perfect. And where we're at in sort of the transition and recovery, we're going to get a lot of great insight and information today. So without any further ado, I want to introduce my guest, Elias Sosa, who's the owner and general manager of Estancia 460 in Tribeca 460 Greenwich Street. Elias, thanks a lot for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for the advice, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Love to get to talk to you, learn more about you guys as well, and share whatever experience I can. That's awesome. We were talking right before we started this, how you guys are a Tribeca institution, really a New York institution. I lived in Tribeca for a number of years with my family. So before we jump into it, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and also the history of Estancia? Maybe do that first, a little bit of history of Estancia and then yourself and how you got involved. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So I am first generation Argentine American on my dad's side. He basically escaped a war-torn country in the 80s, came to the United States, opened up Novacento in the late 80s, early 90s, met my mom. He left Novacento and then opened up Sosa Barella, which is our former name, in 1995. My parents had their 15 minutes of fame in the 90s, was written up in every article, Time Out, Zagat, everything you think of. And then after 9-11, business got messed up real hard, and we actually found an opportunity to open up a second location in midtown Manhattan on 50th and 8th, right around the corner from the Gershwin Theater where Wicked plays. And my dad had that location for about 15 years. He closed it down in 2015. We tried to open up another place called Lomito. Lomito is what we call a sandwich in Argentina in 2007, but the recession took that out real quick. And now we are down to our last location, which I took over about three years ago. Let my mom and dad kind of enjoy an early retirement while I took the reins. And here we are. We've been a family neighborhood restaurant for 26 years. All of our customers come about like three, four times a week. We have birthday parties for the kids, for the parents, and everybody, and we're basically like the living room of Tribeca is how I'd like to put us. That's definitely the case, and the great thing about Tribeca, I I was born and raised in New York City and moved back to New York from Chicago, I think it was 93, lived in the West Village, but when I moved to Tribeca in probably about 2003. It's always been a phenomenal neighborhood for families, a phenomenal... I I remember actually, Elias, when it was the butter and egg market. I remember my dad going down (laughs) there to actually pick up butter and eggs at the Harry Wills Mm -hmm. facility. And Steve and his son has real estate there. But Tribeca is one of those amazing neighborhoods. When I lived there, and I still have family who live there on North Moore Street, that is really so great for families. It, it had an artist vibe to it. Over the 26 years, though, it's changed quite a bit. How have you been able to maintain that connection with the community, even mm-hmm. throughout all those massive changes that have gone on? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And honestly, I have to give a lot of credit to my parents. Uh, they're both were so good at what they did and they complimented each other really well until they got divorced. But I got to tip my hat off to them. They have great business acumen and they're really good with people. And they're just the type of people that naturally flock to them. They have this energy about them that I think people find attractive. And I think you could come up with a lot of reasons. You could say, oh, good with numbers. But frankly, I think it just came down to the it factor. I think both my parents had it. I think they passed it off to me. And I'm really not so sure if there's much more of an explanation other than just kind of the it factor. And I think some people have it and and some people don't. And for whatever reason, through 9-11, through the recession, they managed to keep their businesses going even when they're on the verge of closing down. And I kind of went through that with the pandemic. 
I saw my parents go through that their whole life. And then the pandemic gave me my turn to see if I got it or if I don't. And we survived one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with in my life. And all I can say is that, you know, I'm, I'm good at a lot of things with the restaurant business, but perseverance is in our blood. Man, that's so well said, and I can so relate to it, and I want to get into that with you. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I would just sort of say in response to your answer, because I think it is a great answer, is it really is an it factor, because I've had on a number of guests that have restaurants throughout New York City. It really is an it factor where you have these neighborhoods, because Tribeca, for people who don't know, and you could really pick any area in New York City, there's a ton of restaurants, yet some of them connect with the neighborhood in a way that lasts for generations. And I think so much of what you're talking about, Elias, I can relate to because I had an opportunity to work with my father for a bit and deal with challenges. But I really think, at least from my vantage point and from what you're saying, it's almost this ingrained attribute that we learn to put customers first, put people first, make that connection. And with mm -hmm. that, everything else follows. But you brought up the pandemic and I would love to hear you talk about that more because I can also agree with you. This was the most challenging situation I've had to navigate in business as well. And when 9-11 happened, we were on Gansevoort Street in New York. Mm. We moved to Jersey C04. Let's go back to sort of the tough mm. part and we'll transition to where we are now. Mm -hmm. What were some of the first decisions that you had to make early on that enabled you to weather the pandemic? Take me back to that experience. Sure. To give a little bit of context, when the virus first made it to the United States. I was in Florida celebrating my grandma's 80th birthday. And by the time we get back to New York, everyone is like, the world is about to shut down. New York City is about to shut down. And I get back to New York 10 days before the city shut down, May 6th. So I knew this was coming. I saw it and I knew what I had to do. It was unfortunate, the steps I took for other people in terms of the amount of employees that I had who had been with me for years that I had to furlough. We cut our staff. I mean, I cut staff down from 25 full-time and part-time employees down to 10. And I kept my guys who had been with us since 1995, basically. We put their kids through college. We've helped them raise their families and helped them kind of build a career for the even half family. So I decided to keep those guys on. And Basically, when it came to numbers, I mean, I knew we had a good delivery service as it was, and I knew we were going to be doing takeout and delivery for a really long time. I didn't believe that we would only be shut down for two weeks. I expected it to last a lot longer. So I basically broke down what we make revenue-wise inside the restaurants, you know, dine-in. And then I figured out what we typically make from delivery, you know, without a pandemic going on. And it was like, all right. Well, if we're only doing delivery, I'm just going to use the numbers that I make off delivery per day and expect that revenue to come in every day until the city reopens up and I have my normal business back. Luckily, I was actually like very spot on with my projections. What I expected to make was basically exactly what we made every day until outdoor dining opened up last June. And then I staffed accordingly, which meant I kept... Almost everyone in my kitchen besides one guy, I only had three of my longest tenured waiters left and myself working for three months. And I was pulling 80 to 90 hours a week for a good four months there just to keep the overhead down. I took a lot of items off the menu that were super costly and wouldn't be ordered over delivery. I basically actually really heavily leaned on Woolco to provide me most of my goods because you guys, one, had great customer service, have a great relationship with your sales rep, Joseph. And he's helped me out a lot throughout the pandemic. And yeah, I'm going to basically cut out literally every vendor besides you guys during the pandemic to make sure I consolidate my orders to one company and be more organized that way. I know that's a little bit of a long-winded answer. No, it's a I, great I answer. And you could go on. And I think we have a lot of people who listen that already have a restaurant or hospitality business, but we have a lot of young entrepreneurs that listen as well. Mm -hmm. And what you just described is the absolute blueprint of what it means to be you know, a wartime CEO. That's kind of a cliched phrase that's thrown around a mm -hmm. lot. But to put it in less dramatic terms, when you're confronted with challenges in business, it's the responsibility of the leader to assess the situation, make the tough choices, 
have a strategy and execute, and you described it perfectly. Thank you. So let me ask you this. I'm curious, Elias, because I mm-hmm. spoke with a number of our customers throughout that time. You had your projections spot on with mm-hmm. respect to takeout. Did you find that there was any increase in takeout and perhaps even during the lunch hours, or was there any change in volume as a result of the pandemic? Did you pick up new people in the neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera? I love that question. So (laughs) during the daytime was brutal. So I was working like doubles almost every day besides Sunday. And I would basically have maybe three deliveries during the day. And then I would have to figure out what to do with my time. So what I did is typically we didn't deliver past Houston Street. And we didn't deliver further down than Barclays. So I expanded our delivery regions. I had a delivery guy who lost his job come to me and take more shifts. So I expanded our region. We got way more customers and exposure by expanding our Grow Up boundary and our website delivery boundary, which really helped bring in new customers. And then on top of that, I created a to-go cocktail list that was made legal at some point during last year at the height of the pandemic. And... I had all this alcohol sitting in my restaurant and nobody to drink it. And I didn't want my wine to go bad. So I basically turned into a salesman. Every time somebody called me over the phone and wanted to place an order, I would lead off and say, hey, just to let you know, we're doing a promo for the pandemic. Any order above $70, you get a free half bottle of wine. And any order above $100, you get a free bottle of wine. And people loved it. I got the inventory at the door. I encouraged people to spend more money just to get that free product. And then I made 16-ounce cocktails for the same price as a regular cocktail. So if you basically get like two drinks in one for $15, we normally charge $15 for a cocktail. I know it sounds a little bit pricey, but we make really good cocktails, so it's worth it if you ask me. Sure. So I basically just turned into a salesman and got my marketing cap on. I was like, how do I get... How do I... Because, you know, the margins in the restaurant industry are from alcohol, right? That's where we make the most money off of. But I was in a situation where I had no ability to make money off of alcohol. So I was just like, all right, you know what? We're going to do volume. We're going to make sure that we're going to give people two cocktails for the price of one. We're going to give them free bottles of wine, make sure it doesn't go bad and inventory doesn't get lost. And that actually really boosted my revenue after I did that. So, I mean, it almost doubled my revenue after I started doing that. So my projections went and I mean, I could give you rough numbers, if that's okay with you. No, no. I mean, I think that is so like, I'm really enthralled by what you're doing because I love learning and I'm big into sales and marketing too. And what you did is like textbook 101, but so brilliant. What you essentially did, and this is what the really great operators did. They Mm -hmm. leveraged the opportunities that existed and turned them into lasting wins for the organization. Because I've Mm got to believe that so many people were introduced to Estancia due to your expanded delivery ratio that may Mm -hmm. not have known about you guys or would have never thought to use you as a takeout option. Let me ask you this. Have you Mm -hmm. found, now that things, you know, thank God have opened up, have you found some people come in that were introduced to your brand during the pandemic through delivery? Yeah. And so that's actually something I failed to mention why I love your question so much is I now have regulars that discovered me just walking by who were taking walks from Chelsea or would order from our expanded boundary for delivery. They now come to a restaurant all the time or now locals or friends of mine as well. So yeah, I mean, it's crazy because we weren't ready for it. We had our local customers who came back after the pandemic kind of cleared up a little bit. And then we had our new regulars that I got during the pandemic doing these promotions with alcohol and delivery. So now I have more customers than I ever had before. And, it's awesome. You know, it's great. The only problem was that staffing-wise, I wasn't prepared for it because everyone moved out of the city. All the college students I had working for me went back home. I'm sure I have some staff that doesn't want to come back because unemployment's still going on. Whatever the reason is, or they're disincentivized from working in the restaurant industry and going to gig economy jobs. So I'm still understaffed, but I have so many customers and thankfully we like it so much that they are totally understanding of why our service might not be as fast as it used to be, but we're getting there. You know, it's interesting. That's a common challenge that everyone's facing, but the only people that are facing it are the ones that were able to really find a way to navigate what was the most challenging and multifaceted 
problem or crisis, whatever you want to call it, that I've ever seen in my business career. And I think that when people look back on this, people are going to be looking at restaurants and restaurateurs like yourself and how they navigated it because this was a real-time set of problems that to most people would be almost seemingly insurmountable. Okay, here's the problem, guys. You're not going to allow people into your restaurant. You're not going to be able to have the usual ability to sell your menu of options. And we don't know when it's going to end. And by the way, and I don't know if you'd agree with me, I think you would. I don't think the hospitality industry was really given any support or even encouragement by a lot of government officials when they should have been. It's great that they did the to-go cocktails, which I hope that they will make permanent, and the outdoor seating. But mm -hmm. there was a lot of things done at the governmental level that I felt could have been more supportive. But I really mm -hmm. commend you. And, you know, that's what it takes sometimes in business. And, and you turned it into an absolute win. So now let's transition a little bit further into the dynamic, because what you're describing is something that's pervasive across the country and certainly in New York, which is businesses come back in a far more robust manner than I would have anticipated this early on. And the biggest thing I hear are people having a difficult time with staffing. So mm -hmm. as you face this new challenge, Elias, how are you navigating that in terms of what you communicate to your customers? How are you managing your staff? Because obviously they're more mm -hmm. pressed. How are you navigating this challenge now that you're facing it? So I live and die by hiring within or promoting within and finding somebody off the streets. I mean, there's so many whack jobs in the restaurant industry and anyone you find off Craigslist, you know, never seems to be a good fit. So staffing wise so far, I've actually only been able to hire two people for on the floor. My kitchen is good to go because those guys are rock solid. So, I mean, I basically convinced a waitress to quit her job. You know, I furloughed her, brought her back, but she can only do one shift because she had a nine to five job at an office that she was very unhappy at because she also has other desires other than that, you know, acting and school. So I convinced her to quit her job and I gave her more shifts. And I was like, listen, I'm giving you more freedom. I'm giving you more money. And she was sold. And then I have a bartender that I brought back who was also into acting and he takes acting classes. And I asked him, can you just ask around your acting class and see if anybody needs a job? Because I'm sure they do. And then I hired a really great hostess and waitress through that as well. So I've basically been trying to do word of mouth. I mean, I know that I have a lot of actors who work for me. I know that in the acting community, they, they survive off of working at restaurants for the most part. So I figured, hey, why don't I just like try to talk to my actor bartender and see what's up in his community and if anybody needs a job and it worked out so far. I've just been trying to force myself to think outside the box. You know, yeah. I, I could go on Craigslist, I'm sure, and find a bunch of people. I could go on Indeed, but... I'd rather ask somebody who I trust to see if you know anybody and then find something through them because I figured if he trusts that person and I trust him, then you know, it'll probably work out more often than not. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, focusing on quality in the beginning. And I would just say to people that are listening that right now, there's a lot of demand for workers and that's going to continue. But as the enhanced unemployment gets closer and closer to expiring, mm -hmm. those people who want to get a job and the hospitality space is a phenomenal industry to work in, and I think it's going to be an especially great one to work in as we come out of this. The mm -hmm. sooner you start looking for work, the better it is for you because you're in demand. I think if everybody waits till the end, they're going to lose a lot of leverage, just a thought on that. But another thing you mentioned is that your clientele has been very understanding and they've been terrific, and that's something I've heard as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you've noticed the clientele? What's the vibe now versus pre-pandemic? Because what I'm hearing is everybody is so happy to be back out that it's more of a laid back, almost collaborative vibe. But I'd love to get your thoughts on that. I mean, I think that's spot on. Everyone I see who comes into the restaurant now and the more the city reopens, I see there's just like a sense of relief when people come into the restaurants. And before the pandemic, I mean, and, and you and I both know Tribeca very well, that type of neighborhood can attract people who are extremely ungrateful or rude or have never worked in the restaurant industry. So don't know how to talk to restaurant staff like they're people and not just the help, basically. But now that's totally gone away. People now seem to truly appreciate restaurant workers and the restaurant industry a lot more than they did in the past. I think, especially in New York City, people are like, well, if I don't get in my way and I'm going to be upset and I'll never come back or I'll leave a bad review. But now people are like, wow, I mean, we got this privilege taken away from us for a whole year. 
we never realized how good we had it in a place like New York City to be able to eat out. I mean, you can get any cuisine in the world you want and it'll probably be just as good as to make it back home. So I think people didn't realize how spoiled they were to have mom and pop shops available or mm-hmm. even they're like Peter Luger's and Wolfgang's to, you know, ball out at. No doubt. Now, something that's really cool about your menu, which leads me to my next question is mm-hmm. you have Argentinian cuisine as well as Italian cuisine. Mm-hmm. And the question I have is, and this is something that I think about a lot. So you are a very well established institution in Tribeca, 26 years phenomenal. At the same time, I'm curious, what type of outreach, if any, do you do for customers that are not from the neighborhood? Are you just basically so well situated with your regular clientele in the neighborhood that it's not something you need? Or do you find that it's something that you do market to? Because obviously Tribeca, every year, it seems to me, it becomes more and more of a destination spot, not just for Mm -hmm. New Yorkers, but for tourists. There's tons of stuff going on there. Is that something you market to as well, or you just let it happen organically? So that's actually something that I've always struggled with, to be honest. I've always just thought the best way to get yourself well known is that every new customer or maybe it's their second time, just check in on them, be nice to them, give them a smile, treat them well, and they'll come back. We get so many companies that solicit us saying like, oh, we're from Silicon Valley and our company's been around for two years and we're going to help grow your profits by like 10x or whatever. I'm like, I don't think it's going to happen, man. I mean, the restaurant industry has been around forever before Grubhub and all these like technology platforms. People come back because they like the people who work there. They like the experience that was given to them there. Every time I notice a new customer come in, I always make sure to get to know them, see how they found out about us. And more often than not, I find them coming back. I really don't know what platform to use marketing wise. If you got one for me, I'm happy to figure it out because I need people from the Upper East Side to come to me. I need people from Murray Hill and the Lower East Side, it comes to me more. I mean, I have the financial district, Tribeca, Hudson Square, West Village. I'm well known in that sense. But when it comes to the other neighborhoods further uptown, I don't know how to get those people in the door like every weekend. And yeah, I definitely need help with that myself. (laughs) Well, I would just say, because I was listening closely to your answer and everything you're saying is really so correct and so essential to be successful in the industry because For sure, my thoughts are, if people don't get right the fundamentals that you're talking about, you can get the best marketing, the best everything. It's going to be meaningless. And the part that you're talking about, the connection you make with everyone that comes in, turning people that are your customers into ambassadors, the phenomenal relationship you have with your team that they've been there, that's the really hard part. And the other stuff is almost an add-on. Since you asked me, I mean, I would, there are some different strategies, which Actually, there's an interview I did with a guy, and he's going to be doing a webinar. I'm going to make it available to all Wilco customers. But I think, quite frankly, that the entire zeitgeist of the hospitality industry has shifted even more towards authenticity and humanity. So I think for something like you, once people are aware of it, anybody who lives in Midtown or uptown, wherever they are that's not in that sort of circle you mentioned, if they know about a spot like yours— and the cuisine appeals to them, they're going to be coming there. They're going to be Mm -hmm. coming there. So it's the same challenge I have. Like, I'm very proud of what we offer our customers, and thank God we've grown and we do everything we can. But I'm always saying to myself, if everybody that could use Wilco knew that we existed, we would have so many more sales. And I think it's the same for you, but I think that it's going to move in that direction. There is no magic formula that I've ever found. I think the Mm -hmm. magic formula is exactly what you described. Yeah. And a conversation I had, and I don't mean to name drop, but I went to Miami a little while back and I got really lucky and I happened to meet Dave Grutman and I saw him and he sat down and had a conversation with me and and this guy runs Miami. You know, I didn't really know him before I met him that day. And he basically said to me, you know, you can read all the books you want. I was telling him, that was Dave. I was like, I'm reading all these books. I don't try to pick the brains of like all these successful restaurateurs who have multiple places like you, but I've, I've never met anyone besides you. And so I just figured I'd go to the books and he's like, listen, you can read all the books he wants. And he was the one who told me you either got it or you don't. And that's when I realized I have it. And that's when I realized my parents have it. And that was a really influential conversation that I had that really changed my perspective. And I was just like, you know what? He's right. I just got to smile, wave, kiss some babies. And I think everybody will be happy. No question about it. I mean, the restaurant business has been around for 
hundreds of years. And all of these new changes, which are not even that new, third-party delivery service. You and I have lived in New York, Elias. Mm -hmm. I was getting delivery when I was a kid. You know, having food delivered is no big deal. The third-party thing, that's kind of something new. Social media, yeah. all that stuff's helpful. But the fundamentals are mm -hmm. there, and it is an art form, and people have it and some people don't. That's why I think your description of what you've done, which leads me to my next question. Mm -hmm. What do you do if it's done deliberately or not, but how have you been able to, or how much of a priority is it for you to build and maintain this relationship that you have with your team? How much of a priority is that in your day-to-day -day operations? I will defend my employees like to the depth, to be honest, especially like the, the guys in the kitchen and the guys who have been with us for 20 plus years, who have worked underneath my parents and worked underneath me. When everyone lost their jobs besides my main guys and I could barely afford to pay them anything. I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to make sure these guys get paid and their families get fed. And luckily I was in a position where I could like afford to live off my savings, but I also opened up a credit card that had like two years, no APR on it to keep me afloat while I was keeping my employees afloat through the revenue that we were generating, which was very little. So I knew these guys were making half of what they used to make, but basically I told them, you know, we're going to war together and whatever happens outside these walls, you know, it doesn't matter to us. Whatever's going on inside here is our main priority and we just got to get through this together and we're going to come out stronger on the other side. So if I didn't have some of the guys that I do at my restaurant, some of them are literally like irreplaceable. These guys have raise their families off of this stuff and come to work every day, rain or shine. There's never an excuse and never have to deal with anybody who just doesn't show up. And they're, they're all in on the product and they believe in me and I believe in them. And I think it's just as simple as that. I think it's a reflection of you and your parents as leaders and also on how you treat people. I have a similar dynamic here at Wolco where we have so many people that have worked here for 20 years, 30 years, 15 years. And I would say that that was one of the great strengths that we had that enabled us to not just weather the pandemic, but use it as an opportunity to get to a place that I wouldn't have thought we would have gotten to as quickly as we did. Because when you have people that are so invested in your business and have been there for years, they will go to war with you and they will go mm -hmm. that extra mile. But loyalty is a two-way street. And if you haven't totally. built up those years and years of relationships and that loyalty, then you can't draw on it when you need it. I just think it's so important in any business. Let me ask you this, Elias. What sure. do you think are some of the main lasting positive changes that have come out of the pandemic, whether it's the to-go cocktail or something we haven't discussed? What do you think have been some transformative positive changes that are going to be a part of the hospitality industry going forward? Well, for sure, the to-go cocktails. I think just an overall level of appreciation that people didn't have for the restaurant industry before that they've found through this past year. Hopefully, this is just transitory inflation and your guys' prices will go down along with everyone else's. So hopefully that's not like a lasting effect and hopefully just transitory. But I would say just like the overall attitude that people bring into the restaurant. I mean, I truthfully expect that to change as the world normalizes. I'm sure people will go back to the old ways and to some extent, maybe not as extreme as before. But I think for me, my staff and I, I think we really gained a bonding experience. I mean, they were looking to me to, you know, make sure that their lives weren't completely ruined. And I was looking at them for the same thing. It was like, I need you guys. I can't close down this restaurant for a whole year. And I don't have that type of money. If we close down, we're out of business. You know, it's as simple as that. And, and I was like, if I'm out of business, you guys are out of a job. So I think it was a great bonding experience. It was a great way to like build trust with each other and, you know, I, I think it's really, you know, my relationship between the staff, my the customer's relationship with restaurants all over the city. And yeah, hopefully the lasting effects are not like $20 pieces of steak <laughs> forever. But <laughs> no, I hear you. With respect to the inflation, I think some of it is transitory because I do think that certain items are priced the way they are due to temporal issues, such as certain companies not having appropriate staffing. There's a lot of issues with items being imported overseas because, you know, we're importing so much stuff and there just isn't even containers. Some of it, you know, we'll have to see how it shakes out. But I think that something you said, which I, I agree on and I think is so important, is I, and, and I, I had really thought this would happen even in the darkest days. I said, mm -hmm. when this ends, the, the hospitality industry is going to be elevated to a position that it has not been at where people – because 
Every day during the, the height of the pandemic, people were talking about the restaurant business, which was a clear indication of how important it is and how elemental it was in people's lives. And now that it's back, people, I think, are interacting and appreciating it, like you said, and hopefully that will last. And I think that it will. If you were to give one or two crucial bits of advice for somebody that's just getting started in this industry, they want to open up a restaurant, what would you say is the number one or the number one and two things that somebody needs to really focus on and have dialed in at the beginning? Well, I think if you want to open up a restaurant, if you lock yourself into a lease, I mean, luckily the prices have dropped down, but like basically the minute you sign a lease, that's way too expensive. You're signing a death sentence, in my opinion. The rent is a huge killer in New York City and your employees cost a lot of money. Taxes are insane. I would suggest to somebody to find, and it's hard nowadays, you know, because New York City is so overly developed, but I would look for a niche. I would look for a niche in a certain neighborhood that necessarily doesn't have your product. You know, make sure that you have a lease that you're able to sell out of as well, especially nowadays, because I mean, who knows where the dollar is going to be in a few years. So I would say like, just don't sign a death sentence by signing rent that is astronomical. Make sure you know what your product and identity is going to be. And then through that, know what your product cost is going to be. And then know what your margins are for sure. Because especially with food, I mean, you got to seriously weigh out every single piece of meat to know how much it costs per ounce, not only per pound, and then figure out your price point on the menu from there. I know there was a few, but... I personally think that this is a great time. Like my parents opened up their second restaurant after 9-11 because all the real estate prices dropped down. Everyone moved to Jersey City. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a great opportunity for people to go into the restaurant industry. If you've been thinking about it, I would go for it. I think overhead, minimize it as much as you can. And we're still in a very much like a to-go and take-out type of world. We were heading that way before the pandemic and the pandemic kind of exacerbated it. So like, I think if you want to open up a taco shop, Open up like a 900 square foot taco shop. Your rent is going to be super low. You don't have to worry about seeing people and you can just push a bunch of tacos out the door and still make your rent because your overhead is minimized. You, if you have 900 square feet available to you, you probably only need like two chefs or maybe one chef and a what, cashier. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways to open up a restaurant without overextending yourself. And I really think simplicity is, is the name of the game. Every restaurant that thinks they have the best food and drinks in the world and then open up this huge glamorous space, like I think they're doomed from the get-go. If I were to open up another restaurant right now, I mean, this is taking a gamble on nightlife coming back, which it already has, but I would just make it very simple. I think American dive bars are like recession-proof pizza shops. I haven't seen a single pizza shop close down anywhere in New York City. There are ways to make it in the restaurant industry and you don't have to be the best and you don't have to be the most glamorous. And I would probably advise not thinking that way. I would just figure out what people want to eat, what neighborhood is missing a certain product or niche in terms of food. And yeah, just make sure that there's volume involved because it's great. If you you want to open up a place with $70 steaks and $46 dishes of lamb, go for it. But People are not spending that money as much as they are on tacos and pizza and beer. And I think those guys are the most recession-proof products in the restaurant industry. I would just go for simplicity over anything, and especially now since things are a little bit tumultuous. There's no way if you're just like a one-man show that you're going to compete with David Chang or like Gordon Ramsay if you wanted that style of restaurant. I think that's really great. And I have to say this has been one of the... For my own personal edification, this has been one of the most stimulating and informative interviews that I've done. And I think for anybody that's listening that is just thinking about opening a restaurant, you may want to listen to this again because it really is a blueprint. And I've really enjoyed this conversation so much, Elias. And for people that are in New York, you definitely do want to go down and check out Estancia 460. It's at 460 Greenwich Street in Tribeca. We do have listeners that are not in New York. And what I always suggest, especially when I have a guest on who's got a restaurant that's not just in Midtown or in the theater district or anything like that. The best way to see New York City is to go to all the different neighborhoods. And one Mm -hmm. of the best neighborhoods, and I can vouch because I live there, it's got so much great stuff, is Tribeca. And this is, if you want to go to a great neighborhood, stop into Estancia because you're going to get the experience just from talking to you of what a Mm -hmm. real 
New York institution, well-run restaurant is about, man. Just really yeah. appreciate it, man. I really enjoyed this conversation and I appreciate you. For sure. Honestly, you remind me of one last thing and thank you so much for having me on my show, but something my dad and I did as a kid, my dad would take me for walks and we would canvas neighborhoods and see what empty spots are available. And we would look inside the windows, we would call places, we would call brokers asking what the renting prices are, even if we weren't serious about the spot, just to get a feel for the neighborhood. So if you're in New York City or anywhere or across the country, I would say like literally it's just as simple as walk around, see what's going on in the neighborhoods that you hang out in or the neighborhoods you don't hang out in if you're trying to get into the restaurant industry, make phone calls to brokers, get a feel for what the prices are in the neighborhood and what restaurants are in that neighborhood that you might be competing with or not competing with. And I think it's as simple as that to get an idea of what your markets and submarkets are like. That's awesome. Elias, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I could go on forever, but I want to respect your time. I really, <laughs> no I really could because I could talk about this and the way you've approached everything. But I think the bottom line message for me in this is that out of challenge comes opportunity. If you put in the work early and you make the tough decisions and you have the core foundation and then you can build on it. But mm -hmm. really enjoyed it, Elias. I want to thank you again and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks so much, Stephen. I'll definitely share your podcast around to all my friends and family so they can check us out on today's show. Have a great have day. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. Please be sure to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And to learn more about Woolco Foods or Stephen Toberoff, please visit us at woolcofoods.net.